and uh, uh, Would you like to prescribe two sulfonylureas together? Yeah, I think, but there, I mean, the Canadians have looked into this, so this very question you're asking. Yeah, there have been some studies. No, but I mean, it doesn't show, um, show a big improvement, so that is why basically we don't do it. So one, I mean, I think from a mechanistic point of view, we don't need to do it. Number two, I think if you ask for studies, there have been studies, small studies, which have looked into it and didn't make a great difference. So the question is about where to place it. So, um, well, so, so three, correct. I mean, in terms of RCTs, we, we only have uh, you know we don't have a RCT for Wilder which is very true. So we only have uh, pooled analysis from um, obviously you know face to face through trials, looking at um, you know pooled data, looking at it in totality. So, um, in relevance to this question, so, I mean, what about the other glyptins, especially tenly glyptin and vildiglyptin? So, if you look at, you know, in terms of superiority from an RCT standards, you know, vildiglyptin uh, comes a little bit lower because there's no RCT. Um, and tenly you know, there's nothing um, really long term or, you know, uh, huge data which look into it uh, completely. So, where would I place it from an evidence point of view? I would probably place it below citiglyptin. As I was listening to both the talks, I was just wondering, is there like uh, an absolute contraindication where you do not think about using the DPD4? I personally feel that if somebody's got a history of pancreatitis, do not use it. Uh, because, you know, you've got an uh, array of other drugs to use in the treatment of diabetes. So that is an area where I don't think you should risk it. But other than that, there is no contraindication. You know, there's this very interesting uh, comment I heard about DPP4 inhibitors. It's the over-the-phone drug. You know, if somebody's got a high blood sugar and, you know, like we are not supposed to do it, if somebody makes you a phone call, you can prescribe it safely over the phone because it's so safe. That, 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 that's the big advantage. And actually extending from that, I mean, I think as, um, as I mentioned, it's a go-to drug um, even on the phone. So an inpatient setting, I mean, there's one drug where you can, you know, you can really safely use this, um, you know, um, without any problem is, is clearly that gives us a big advantage. So in fact, there is a very good trial which was actually published in the Lancet um, called the CITA hospital trial, which actually interestingly compared, um, you know, citalopram with um, actually basal insulin um, in, in a setting where, um, you know, um, glycemic efficacy and discharge from hospital were compared and actually it was very good. So I think, you know, um, so I, I do agree that it's a go-to drug and with, with that strong data, you know, you could actually just be very confident that you're not going to cause any harm and actually it's going to cause benefit. So actually leading on from that question, um, quite often when we see people in the hospital post MI uh, or if they are admitted to the hospital for say query angina, they're going to undergo an angiogram or they've had an event, uh, in general I tend to stop an STLT2 inhibitor. Would you do the same? I would agree with you, you know, and I think these, uh, obviously when somebody is having a cardiac procedure or is having an infarction, they are hemodynamically unstable and that is one of the contraindications of SGLT2 inhibitors. One has to remember that the usage of SGLT2 inhibitors and the benefit it produces is a chronic benefit. It is not something that you get in an acute setting. So, you know, in an acute sec setting, I do not think I would use any kind of SGLT2 inhibitor. I think I definitely agree. I mean, especially with you know someone who's been hospitalized recently, whatever the cause, whether it is basically in relevance to you know an acute um, you know infective event or whether they have surgery, um, you know the DPP4 there, I, you know I'd be completely safe. I wouldn't have any issues at all with it. Whereas with the SGLT2, there are so many ifs. Um, you know, you need to make sure that they stop it. They give them adequate fluids. Um, you know, if they are insulinopenic, they're also on insulin. You need to make sure that they don't they don't utilize any DKA. So all those issues are there. I and mean, although you know I've got fantastic data on those drugs. Those, I mean, so, I mean, those safety issues sometimes can, can be sometimes, you know, uh, which we need to kind of keep in mind. Um, and the DPP4 is actually score over in that aspect. Um, and the longevity, I think that's a very important issue. So, um, in India, unfortunately, you know, we don't have people following up regularly. And a lot of times we see people who present to the clinic and then they come back like six months or a late, year later. 
and it, and they've just been taking this, the say, you know, DPP4, and you can be sure and reassured that actually nothing's going to happen. But I'll be a bit concerned if they're on an SGLT2 and they don't do what we ask them to do, as in like you know, drink enough water, they don't stop um, you know prior to going uh, going under a surgeon's knife, um, or if basically they get dehydrated due to other causes. So those are our issues. So I particularly brought that up because I think uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are being used more and more by cardiologists and we're seeing a tendency for it to be started like within two to three days of a hospitalization for an acute cardiac event so I thought it was important to sort of bring it up. I would personally wait at least about two to four weeks after a discharge from a hospital, see them in the outpatient setting before I would initiate that. And uh, just again a thought that just came to mind, have you used DPP4 inhibitors and in people on like uh, on uh, NG feeds, RT feeds? I personally haven't had the experience of using it, in, uh, but I, I don't see any contraindication to it. You know, if somebody's on a basal insulin and maybe you can bring down some of the surges by using a Clipton through the RT. But I think this is an interesting area. I think uh, we, we need to find out how efficacious it is when given through the naso nasogastric route, uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I've been using cetaglutin with metformin a lot with uh, fantastic results. Can we even say sometimes up to 1.5? Uh, as you said, in Asians, it's a much better response. So I've seen that. But one patient I had a very peculiar experience. Uh, I started the patient on, uh, he was a person with non-healing uh, diabetic foot ulcer. When he came to me, he was with very poor control, h one once he was nine. So I had to put him on some medication, got that thing down and he used to come for dressings because it was, the vascular supply was poor. It took a lot of time for the leg ulcer to heal. And I started him on uh, cetagliptin and metformin. And uh, about five or six, uh, six days later, he started complaining of itching. Initially, I didn't attribute the uh, uh, the itching to citagliptin and metformin and uh, I thought that it was something else I put him on Allegra, other things to control the itching thinking because I had put so many patients on uh, citagliptin and metformin and there's no, there never been, I have never encountered this problem I did blood tests on him and incidentally I found that he had eosinophilia at that time uh, when I did the blood test, that was absolute eosinophilia count was high and then after that, after one or uh, two months I finally th thought why not stop the citagliptin and metformin and just put him on metformin alone because the HPMC by that time had come down very well. It had come to about 6 and our leg ulcer was healing. And after that the itching completely stopped. And then I incidentally went into the net and I found a small study. It was only about 6 people and that were patients who were on augment, especially males, were on augmentin and citagliptin and metformin, this combination. There is an incidence, uh, there is a, uh, uh, some of them develop a small percentage of them statistically significant develop eosinophilia and they develop this itching. This I came across in a small study afterwards. Uh, uh, when I was going through, I was really wondering why because I never encountered this problem in any of my patients. It's just one patient. And he stopped. Once I stopped them, the itching completely stopped. So I just wanted to share Thank you. Thank you. We, 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 the more we are using gliptins very commonly, I think two side effects are, maybe three side effects are coming up that I think we need to mention. One is skin. Uh, I've had a number of people, there are at least three cases where the dermatologist has said it's because of the glyptin, the DPP for inhibitor to stop it because they have like a peculiar maculopapular rash. I can never understand their, you know, the, the term they use for it. Is it a syncretic reaction or something like that? So you just, you know, maculopapular rash with glyptin is recognized with, uh, with all the glyptins. So, uh, I, I, I have seen a few patients, I have seen a few patients. Because he used to really come to me crying, saying that I, I, I can't control, the only problem is the itching doctor. This, I'm is, not. this, this is probably, you know, uh, I don't know. It's just a one-off case, yeah. because after that I've used so much of uh, cetagliptin and metformin, I've never come across this at all. It was one patient I had this. And after that I repeated the blood test and the use of the count had come down after that. It's just a single case. So, very peculiar. I think the second side effect that I've been thinking about more frequently is constipation. Uh, which has been well described with the DPP4 inhibitors and uh, uh, I think in people with diabetes it's a very common complaint and it's something to keep in mind about the DPP4 inhibitors and third is I think uh, uh, the arthralgias. Again all of this like you mentioned are probably, I mean they're not common enough to, for it to be a contraindication definitely. 
Exactly. But it is a idiosyncratic, but it's important that we keep these things in mind and think about it when they present with that if they're on DPP for inhibitors. So I think there are no more questions. Yeah, we'll wind up the session and I thank both the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you.